Hello, everybody. Welcome um, to our second annual sort of SETI Enchanted Tech Summer Festival. I am so, so delighted to welcome um, Emine. Um, she's this just amazing artist who works with paper and technology and ideas to make just, just magical, delightful, wondrous things that really make you question and think and reflect. Um, uh, Emine is a professor at Carnegie Mellon and has um, made a lot of work around and also sort of a critical engagement with technology in the world, which I think is really important, um, addressing issues of sort of um, the craft involved, which often is um, invisible and the labor as a result. And, and the question of who, who gets sort of noticed or recognized for this work and who's behind the scenes and invisible. Um, I will stop talking because you're much more, and she's gonna say much more amazing, exciting things and show some of her work. And we'll have time at the end um, for a, Q&A, so add your questions in the YouTube chat or the Discord if you're, and I, and I, will, I will start asking them, um, and, and your comments and ideas. But um, welcome, Imin. I'm so excited to have you present. Um, this is amazing. And, Thank um, you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll just jump into the slides. Um, hi, so my name is uh, Imin Ye, as mentioned. I'm a uh, professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm calling this artist talk playing with time and with paper and I wanted to share a lot of projects that seem like sort of long winded from, you know, inspiration or objects I found many decades ago through making 40 years later and then gifting back in this weird like cycle of play and time and paper. But then I like last night thought, oh, there's another title, which is just that I think I'm in Ye has a complicated relationship with electricity. And so I really appreciate the introduction of sort of that, that criticality of, of technology and progress in the digital and why someone who is l working with paper um, is invited to speak at you know, a program like this. So why paper? Um, for me, I have a printmaking background. My original love in art making was print, was print. And both print and paper together, I think of as like this sort of very old technology what is sort of the one of the most things that stand out for us as species is this desire to tell stories, find a whole system, right, to communicate that, create technologies to like produce a modular um, object to carry those stories and a whole elaborate series of technologies, right, from as simple as stamp works all the way, obviously, into sort of um, our, our digital viral area, right? To carry our stories to as many people. So for me, the root of all of it, it comes to paper. Um, and one of the things that I, I talk about a lot with my students is, um, you know, a, about books. And so the oldest book that we still have like physical uh, remnants of, right? From 868 is the Diamond Sutra and the Dunhuang Caves and really centering kind of the beginning of, of the book far earlier than kind of the Western um, framework of the Gutenberg Bible or the technology of the movable type that, that far, um, you know, five, 600 years pr prior to that. And, and of course before, because we don't always have those artifacts, humans were, were simply just carving, making impressions um, and trying to communicate with as, as many people as possible. The other thing I love about paper is though, we look at it as like, oh, it's ephemeral or paper is dead or it's wasteful and all of these things like paper is a very stable element and object, right? So we have paper from almost its 2000 year old history still still here, right? Kept in certain conditions, it is, it is here to tell the human story. Um, the other thing about me is that I'm Ch Chinese American. And when I was young, one of the crafts that I loved to do was the art of Chinese paper crafting. Um, thinking about how just a piece of paper does not have in any real inherent value, but through the labor and the time of like cutting um, and working it, it can be transformed into something extremely delicate, extremely valuable. Um, it can invest, you can invest the value in it just, just through the work. And so paper crafts or paper cutting is a big influence in my work. And I like to start the talk with just thinking about some of the best art you make will probably find its roots in something that you liked when you were small. And I, as a young kid, loved the paper craft, paper cutting, the Chinese paper cutting. I have um, this memory of this bunny pair of scissors that as like a three-year-old, I would just sit and cut paper. And I think a lot about how young 
kids just know what to do. They will make the world that they want with the simplest of materials. Um, for everyone watching in this slideshow, I like to share a lot of my process video, uh, process shots and studio shots of how I make everything. What you're seeing in the slides are sculptures made entirely of paper in hollow form, um, simply by geometry and math and tailoring and folding and gluing. And I wish that I was the kind of artist that knew how to like 3D scan things and use the software to help like unfurl and unfold these objects, but I, I do not. Um, I make everything in old school trial and error. And so I love this slide to show from the sketch to the completed form that it's just, it's a lot of sort of basic geometry and, and practice. So look for the small stuff. In my, in my practice, I look for the small stuff. I let it get big and I, and I let it get playful. Something I've noticed early on when I look at art, when you look at art, there's always these outlets. You know, you go to a museum and you see this big, you know, important sculpture that you're not supposed to touch and hidden right by the sculpture or the painting is always like an outlet. And thinking about objects um, that make a space livable or usable for humans, such as electricity, sharing space with things that are supposed to be sort of the pinnacle of, of, of human creativity that you're not supposed to touch and interact with. And right, they're just different things in our space. So I fell in love. The outlet to me is like the mascot, right, of, of what I think I'm, I'm thinking about when I think about small and useful and, and, and value or what's seeable and what is not seeable. So very early paper sculptures on my end was this paper outlet, um, which I like to hide amongst other artwork and shows, leading towards larger, more ambitious, abstract kind of sculptures. So I did this floor installation um, that had about 30 paper extension cords um, with, with, you know, yards and yards of paper tubes connecting it in this like abstract tangle on the floor. And when I showed this piece, somebody, another artist um, in the group show tried to stick their phone charger into the work, um, which made which made me, you know, delighted because when we think about outlets or, or we think about how much we need, what we really need from things is like how to power our phones. You know, the, the, the desire to like keep our phones and this technology um, um, juiced is, is so strong that despite it being like an art show and clearly kind of a sculpture it was like it was that that logic was denied in favor of of powering a phone and so then I made this paper um, iPhone charger right that ultimately I wanted to build into an again a bigger more abstract installation so I got a chance to do this as a commission for Facebook's Oculus Lab here in Pittsburgh um, which has about 500 paper outlets, um, no, 250 paper outlets and about 500 USB chargers and paper iPhone chargers um, dangling outside of it. Um, and this piece is um, exciting, exciting for me because of the location of where it's placed, right? So the sculpture, the installation like eats the temperature control. Um, it hides actually a lot of the other outlets that are available in this space for people to use. So much so that Oculus Labs had to put this uh, sign up that said, please recharge elsewhere. And I think, um, you know, when I, when I look at this work, I get really, um, you know, ex excited that it's in a, in a site that depends so much um, on being able to charge these gadgets. And there's nothing in this work that's usable other than as an object of contemplation or something to think about. Um, and that it's it's so reduced. So I was really interested in just like the shadow and the light and the form of taking something so commonplace, um, a thing that's in absolutely everybody's homes and everybody's corners and and finding some a little bit of, of beauty in it. Um, do you all see now a, a, a small child holding a laptop? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, you know, after that work was installed, a friend of mine's daughter made this, uh, inspired by the work, made this incredible, like, uh, paper laptop for me, and we traded it as a gift. And what I love about her sculpture is that she included an external hard drive, which I thought was very, like, forward thinking you know, about my backing up <laughs> of, of technology, you know. Um, and so this is a, a, a real inspiration, I think, of the logic behind some of my, my work. And so here I traded her um, one of my sculptures for her, her laptop. 
in the same vein of objects that influence me here in Pittsburgh, when you shovel out a parking space um, from the snow, a lot of people put these things called parking chairs, which are just folding chairs that say no parking to hold the space. And this idea that like the labor that you have done to like clear out your space warrants that space belonging to your car for the entirety of the day that nobody else should park here because I'm the one who cleaned out that space. And so I, th I like, I really think about like the bravado of small cheap objects to like have an increased like sense of space and value. Um, so this is a parking chair sculpture and I have like a little video of how it works. Um, I'm also very interested in, in, in things like this kind of pencil sharpener and that there was a period in, in, you know, time where everyone used pencils so much so that having this sort of cast iron, beautiful object of a, like a mechanical pencil sharpener mounted to your wall was like a necessity in every house, you know, it was like phone jacks outlets, pencil sharpeners. And now we don't, um, to, to imagine that something would take up that space on the wall um, you know, it's, it, you, you don't see anymore. And so this is a pencil sharpener from my friends, one of my friends, um, basement, uh, and she has like a grandma house, you know, like a house that was loved by gra grandma. And so it still had the pencil sharpener in the basement. So this sculpture is called a sculpture for your grandma's basement. It's a copy of the pencil sharpener in, in her home. Um, and inside of the pencil sharpener are all of these handmade pencil shavings and the pencil shavings themselves ended up being like, ex like a big inspiration for me. So what this work is, is called a perfect shaving, which is like mathematically the length of an entire pencil should you be able to like perfectly sharpen the entire twirl. So we're looking at um, paper and then watercolor uh, pencil. In a, in a paper box, a perfect shaving. And then I have a pickle jar practice. So just to sort of introduce the practice, but um, a lot of times people ask like, well, how do you know when you're working so small and so obsessively when something is done? And I started getting these, like my partner loves pickles. So we get like a Costco size pickle jar and filling the jar is what, what I've decided is like done, right? Like I made enough pencil shavings when this jar is done. Here's a half, not even a third jar of paper screws. I need to make more. Um, this is actually a Costco cheese puff container full of spare sauce. And this sculpture um, is best installed, just thrown about your house or in your drawer as just like a spare piece of sauce. Uh, it's a screen print on wax paper. And then this is a jar, a pickle jar of stink bugs. And the stink bugs, have an important story. So the original stink bug was actually a bug that was um, hiding in that installation at fake Facebook Oculus Labs. Um, so it was an original, it was a real stink bug on an art adventure that I made a copy of in paper um, to then include in future iterations of that sculpture. And then sometimes I, I went to like a residency where there were lots of, there was a lot of stink bugs. And so this is like a performance piece. Um, a collaboration with other art residency stink bugs. Um, and then that compost bin, that blue compost bin, all those comp those stink bugs are on were a big inspiration for me. So then a paper uh, pedestal to hold the paper stink bugs. And then I convinced my mother, who is um, actually a, a scientist and um, who retired and then volunteered at the Natural History Museum to like sneak the stink bug into the Natural History Museum. So I like to joke that the stink bug is now part of the Smithsonian. Um, the smallest things that I've made aside from the stink bug might be something like this, this paper screw, which is um, a copy of a, of a overpainted white, white screw in an art space that once held a painting, you know, that kind of got abandoned and left because it was just like painted painted over so many times. And then in my studio, it often holds things like this sculpture for your workplace, this blue uh, paper um, tape, uh, only because ev almost every artist, you know, when they have like a shot of their studio has like a blue tape on their wall. And then the largest thing that I've ever made was this um, sculpture, which is a copy of a black I-beam located in a gallery here in Pittsburgh. 
So the I-beam on the left is the original iron I-beam and the one on the right is the paper sculpture. Um, it has, of course, uh, some electricity powered through it. Um, the problem, even though this is like the largest sculpture I ever made, nobody can ever see it. Um, and so I spent the entire opening like guarding the sculpture from being um, knocked over. And, and just thinking about something that is so big when we go back to like the use value, right? Like something that is so big, that is so structurally important, um, but not the things that you're looking at when you go to an art show, right? Um, is just a big, a, a big theme of the object that interests me. And I love this picture because this I-beam, this paper I-beam hangs out in my house now and it's gotten really like dusty and cobwebby and it almost, it, it, it like looks better. And my joke with, um, you know, sculptors or artists is you should always make artwork that looks better, the dirtier that it gets, you know, and then you don't have to clean anything. And it, you know, it's like the spider web is, um, you know, making it much more realistic. So th that introduces to the project, to my practice or the logic behind my practice. I'm gonna talk about two much more elaborate um, works. And then the last section, I wanted to talk about what this practice looks like in a time of pandemic, in a time of quarantine, and also in a time for me of being a new mother. Um, so uh, some work before quarantine and then how this exists in our new weird, strange world. So um, first I'm gonna talk about the making of the world's first uh, paper facsimile of the world's oldest blue LED light. I got to be an artist in residency at the Sarnoff Collection um, based in the College of New Jersey, which is uh, RCA's corporate archive. Um, and RCA, uh, Radio Corporation of America, it was one of, you know, one of our biggest sort of corporate technology companies. Um, and in this archive is this object, which is the very first, it was a prototype of the very first blue LED light ever invented. Um, and this object is from 1972. And I was so drawn to it for many reasons, mostly because of its scale. And secondly, because of the handmade prototype nature of it, the masking tape arrow, you know, the hot glue and the, um, you know, the, the quickly, quickly folded uh, sheet metal. Um, so the story is, is that in 19, around 1972, an, a young engineer at um, RCA named Her Herbert Paul Maruska developed the first working blue LED light. And this is a picture from their archive. There he is holding the little box with a photo of this little light glowing blue. And they had figured out red, they had figured out green and everyone was trying to figure out the right, um, you know, ele elements to make blue glow. And obviously if you could make blue, then you have developed our, you know, an RGB LED light and all of the possibilities that we now, you know, are very embedded with. Um, but as fate would have it, right when this prototype was made, RCA filed bankruptcy, it closed down and it did not fund this research anymore. And so, um, you know, Herbert, Paul Maruska, he, he moved on to other things. He took his little prototype, threw it in his garage um, until, um, up until 2014, I want to say when a trio of Japanese engineers actually got the Nobel prize in physics for their, their in, in their invention of the blue led light, which is the beginning of the technology of all the blue led lights currently in, and everything that we have. And in their acceptance, they had casually mentioned, well, you know, we appreciate it, but we weren't the first blue LED that uh, Maruska actually developed the first one decades before before us. And the Sarnoff collection contacted him. He was like, I have that old thing. It's in my garage. Do you want it? And just dug it up, sent it to the Sarnoff collection where, um, you know, in 2018, um, I'm in Yeh just uh, you know, saw it for the first time. And so I set out to make a working facsimile copy of this blue LED light. I worked with the curator, the Sarnoff collection, almost entirely through um, email and, and phone pictures. And she sent me a lot of detailed uh, dimensions of how the box was made. Um, here's a paper prototype of a copy of that, again, working just from photos and measurements. And um, at CMU, I got a chance to work with uh, some conductive screen printing ink. So I'm a printmaking professor at CMU, and I got a chance to work with this uh, new material of screen printing ink. And I was playing with how I could make this blue LED light glow um, 
from a small battery, right? So in this paper uh, toy, essentially design, this was the, the, the circuit that we, I finally landed on, a way to, to cut and fold so that it powered the blue LED light. But there it is, the working prototype. Um, but I started, you know, I started this slide lecture talking about that iPhone piece and this urge, I think, within contemporary sculpture to make things bigger or more elaborate. Um, and I'm here at CMU and I have access to so much more technology than just this conductive ink. And I kind of got seduced in the possibility of making this object in a much larger scale. So I set out to make this installation of 64 of these blue LED lights that would all be coded um, to blink in LED, uh, sorry, to blink in Morse code and, and, and say a message. And in order to do that, the next slides kind of show that weird papery adventure it involved making hundreds of paper screws, um, you know, 64 knobs with Q-tip like turns, um, a lot of handmade masking tape arrows. Um, I had to learn how to solder and program these Arduino nanos and in, in order to program each of the LED lights, which, um, you know, I have, I've never done anything like that before. So soldering in 64 little boxes. Um, here's some pictures. And because um, the, the Arduinos needed more power, then I had to hardwire them. And so even though I had those experiments with the conductive ink, it kind of stopped there because we needed more power. We needed more juice. And I think I think more power and electricity is like a big theme of the contradictions in my work. Um, so because it needed more power to power the technology of the Arduinos, I had to solder. I had to learn how to solder and build it and hardwire it. And because of all these wires looking sort of wild, I had to build these hidden shelves that would hide all of the electricity to ultimately um, be embedded and strung through the wall and powered through like a, an outlet. So we're back to the outlet. And I have no idea how to do so many of these things. So I love this picture because this was in the final hour before the show opened and I'm like soldering in the gallery trying to fix the work. Here I am in my studio um, and, and managed to get all of 64 of these uh, uh, programmed and blinking. And then when you make 64 of these like empty copies of LED lights, then you have to build like elaborate boxes to transport them to the gallery. And I think this is important because the same skills I have like box building are the same used to make the sculpture. You know, every like cardboard box that comes in and out of our house is the same material and the same geometry and the same structure of all of these things that are our sculptures. Um, and so here it is in, at the Sarnoff collection in their gallery space. Blinking. And the thing that the sentence that this sculpture blinks is a famous quote by David Sarnoff, the uh, famous chairman of RCA. And the quote is that competition brings out the best in products and the worst in people. And that's like a famous Sarnoff quote, right? Um, because he was just so tough on, on the people that worked for him. Um, and I think a lot about the, the opposite of that within my art practice. Um, I hope that I am making things um, that are just bad products, you know, like uh, they don't work or they just take a, you know, they, they, they're not a good uh, like capitalist product, but they may show the best. And I think like, my own human ingenuity or my own ability as a, a single person to make and conceive and fold and construct these things. And so that quote is a little bit of a, like a um, irony, I think in my work. Um, I'm not gonna play this video, but we're gonna share this link with you all in the, um, in the, in the chat. Um, but it is a link to actually like when the Nobel Prize physics thing came out and people were really like excited to learn about the original LED light. The Sarnoff collection um, actually uh, hired an engineer to try to return on that light. And there's a really amazing video of them on the phone with the original engineer. You know, he lives in Florida and they're like wiring it and they're trying to see if that blue LED light still glows. And at the end of the video, it glows very faintly blue. And you can hear a Maruska in the back oh, after all these years. Um, and it, it's, it's like a beautiful, um, like a 40 year adventure. So I, I guess I started this project, um, you know, 
trying to work through the this sort of this his, this object that's part of the history of of technology my love of, of paper and gifting and multiples and then my job at CMU and the access to things like conductive ink and Arduinos and the sort of text that can help me with all of the programming and, and trying to make this bigger thing of something that was so small that it was just like left in a garage and forgotten but also so big right like also was the original object um, and so because I had all of those um, conductive ink prototypes I gifted one to RCA and it sat in the museum next to the original, you know, until the battery faded. And then it was just, just two lights that sort of once glowed blue. And then I took another one of those, um, of those uh, paper sculptures that free spanned and I sent it directly to Herbert Maruska in Florida um, as a gift, as a surprise gift. And he wrote back, dear professor, yay, what a pleasant surprise the other day when the postman delivered your box. And happy to report that the paper replica arrived in perfect condition and it now sits on a shelf in my office. It's an exact replica of the original, you know, so invented in 72, re in the news in 2014, copied in paper in 2018. And that's, that's the little story of this blue LED light. So the other big project, big recent project I wanted to talk about is called Paper, Paper Film. So in the closet of my office at CMU, I found this film strip um, and this film strip was in new condition. It was clear it was never looked at. And it is a film strip about paper making and printing. And I and um, it was it was published in 1983, acquired by the school in 1987. And they paid almost one hundred dollars for these film strips and film strips are so interesting in the history of the book because it was when we're like, books are dead, like, you know, books are done and they're, they're, they're too fragile and they're disintegrating and making all these dust and we need a more interactive, high-tech way to, to learn. You know, so a film strip in the history of the 2000 year history of paper and books and all that stuff is like a tiny, like a blip, you know, like a blip of time where we thought like if we projected celluloid based film photos of images and then at the same time played an audio cassette of the the words then it would be a much more engaging interactive way to learn um, and so the fact that this object exists to talk about paper and printing despite all the books that are of paper and printing that talk about this story and the fact that like in obviously in 2022 you know, there's no shortage of YouTube, you know, now with digital and the viral and the, uh, the internet, there's no shortage of free content to learn about paper and printing um, was so interesting to me. So I set out to make a copy of this object, but it's published as an artist book. And I got to work with the Women's Studio Workshop in um, upstate New York to publish it as, as a book, as a book object. Um, and so, oh yeah, so sorry, this is the funny little dot matrix receipt that was still in this box. It was clear, the film was so tightly wound, the cassettes still were at the beginning. It was clear that despite buying it in 87, nobody had ever bothered watching this film on paper making and printing. And so this receipt, you know, and it's, it's age technology is one of my favorite things in this, in this book. Um, so to set, to go about making a paper copy, I employed like, every kind of printing that there was. So here's a letter pressed um, foil stamping to do the cover. Um, this is handmade paper, custom dyed to match the foam with like glitter embeds that were punched out on a um, treadle letter press. Uh, here's are the paper foams with the original paper foam, uh, copies of the foam. Every cassette for the film for printing and the, um, Paper film was made by hand um, and then screen printed to get the graphics on it. So there's like paper cassettes, the paper film canisters. And then I had to make a copy of the receipt. So these are actually all like a special kind of Japanese paper that's a uh, tan made Japanese paper that is then coded to be digitally printable. So there's a digital print of the original receipt and then hand perforated and punched out to make that dot matrix matrix paper. 
Um, and then uh, the last part of this artist book is that we needed, you know, we needed a book. Um, um, and so, okay, so here, so here's the, the book. On the left is the original object. On the right is a paper copy of it. And inside where the cassettes usually lay is a small artist book. And in order to uh, make the book, I decided to actually turn all the content that was in the film, film strip, back into a book form. So to do that, we had to listen to the audio. And the Women's Studio Workshop went to everybody's garage and basements and dug out three old boom box in an attempt to play these cassettes. None of them worked um, with the power cord. So we had to get like 16 batteries in order to play it. We finally played it and we had um, one of the interns helping me with the project listen and transcribe the entire cassette on paper making. We had to um, get the images off of these old film strips. So we eBayed this beautiful film projector and projected the images on the wall and then set up a DSLR camera to take pictures of it. Um, and so those projected images and those transcribed texts all came together to be basically a book form of this film strip. So you can still get all of the same content despite not being able to listen to the cassette, cassettes. So this is the final art object, uh, artist book. And what's very exciting for this, this sculpture that is about paper and printing to be in the shape of an artist book is that it has been collected by dozens and dozens of libraries and art collections throughout the country. And so in all of these sort of like library catalogs, you can find this sculpture. If you're, you're looking at fine artist books, you can actually stumble upon an actual sculpture that's, that kind of re-embeds this technology back into like the place and the shape of a book. Um, and then because of course, I have like a gift giving nature in the practice and I was so in love with this projector and technology from our mechanical past, right? Because you have these, you have these knobs and these plugs and these forms and this way to take it all apart and see, um, you know, how it's made. And I think a lot about like our flash drives and even uh, in the cloud, I mean the cloud, right? Like all of our stuff doesn't exist at all anymore, but even a flash drive makes like a crappier sculpture than this film projector, right? Thinking it from, from the object side. So I had to make, um, you know, I had to make a copy of this film projector. Um, so some paper prototypes, you know, uh, watching lots of bad TV while building, knobs. Um, and this is the final, this is the final paper copy of that film projector. And so this sculpture is often displayed with the paper, paper film as a, as a pair of the story. Okay, so here is my like last little section for this talk. It's just called, um, you know, studio practice and how to play in a time of quarantine and as, as a new mother, mother. So the last two years have been a wild time. And when we first shut down, like, Baseball players still wanted to play. And so they let their biggest fans like pay to put big paper cutouts of their faces, you know, so it looked like crowds. And I, I thought that that was better art than I'll ever make, you know, and it's hard to tell in this screenshot, but tiny desk concert would have tiny desk concerts at home and Billie Eilish actually printed out um, just like a photograph of what their studios look like. So it looks like they're there, but it's just, uh, just like a print um, on cardboard of the space. And I remember looking at this being like so delighted because so many of other tiny desk concerts at home were in, in apartments and weird spaces. And I was like, how did Billie Eilish get into that space? And it was, you look closely and it was just a little too perfect. Um, and then this New York Times article came out that despite the fact that we're so connected and, you know, the technology knows our, all of our moves and we're always being tracked, for now, the only way to really prove that you have had your vaccine is to carry these cards. Like the best system that we kind of have because there's so many distribution places and there's so many people and there's not this mega database yet is to just simply pass out these cards. Um, and so that felt like it really like solidified a lot of parts of my practice. Um, this is one of the oldest paper works of mine. This is a downloadable paper mahjong set from 2010. 
Um, it's an entire set of paper mahjong, but uh, it is, exists as a digital PDF you can download off my website with the idea that people could cut and fold 144 tiles and make their own set. Um, and until this point, nobody had ever really done it, though I often show this work in museums and invite people to build. And the, often their tiles look like really, really wonky and not well made, but are like also beautiful in that like release of control, right? Um, so, so I mentioned that when I, um, six weeks into the quarantine, I gave birth to my child and the, while I was laboring, they got this email from a young man in India. And I'll just read a little bit at the beginning. It says, I was interested in Mahjong but couldn't find any sets that I can buy in my state. And that's when I saw your paper Mahjong project. And I decided to do it and completed it in eight days. And after that, my family and I have played it ever since then. Um, God bless you. It was really fun when we played at home because of lockdown. And since it has brought my family together. And so so this is like another like idea of playing with, with time and paper was that I made this project in 2010. In 2020, someone across the world, because of a global pandemic, that locked the world down, really wanted to play Mahjong, found this paper set online, built it in eight days and sent me this picture. Um, and I was opening it while I was like going through contractions and stuff. And these are the pictures of, of him, of him pay, playing paper Mahjong. There he is. Um, and then he actually wanted like a more traditional set. And so he redesigned it with more like of a traditional tile and sent, sent me a picture as well. So I loved, loved that. Um, the other thing that another big part of my practice was that in my post in early postpartum times, I had a lot of postpartum anxiety and ended up losing my ability to sleep for about three or four weeks. I had some pretty bad postpartum related insomnia. Um, and in that time, my partner told me that like, cause he's had in, insomnia his whole life. And he told me that um, one thing he does is try to imagine a place and build it in his mind. And he always built like a rocket ship, but I'm not like a um, rockety person. You know, I obviously I'm thinking, I think about like the home and the small things um, and le like human scaled things. And so the thing I started thinking about was this A-frame cabin far away by a lake where the three of us could just like run away to. And when my daughter started to be able to sleep independently and I got my sleep back and she grew up a little bit I started building it out of the materials of our quarantine so this dream cabin is built at 112th scale entirely out of like Amazon Prime boxes takeout containers no no I didn't buy anything new to make it and dream cabin is how an art practice kind of came back into my world despite being like a new mom and then um you know in in early quarantine times where we really couldn't couldn't go anywhere. I mean, through the last two years, Dream Cabin has gone through, has been um, fixed up, furniture has been added, and slowly artists from all over the country started mailing me small artworks and books to fill this cabin. Um, so here's just some pictures of the what the inside looks like. small gifts. Here's a quick uh, gif of almost all of the objects that have been given. There's almost, there's over a hundred artist works in Dream Cabin um, featuring almost 90 different artists. Um, a big part of the collection is actually a bunch of artist books that are books in them, their own, in their own right. move on. And then um, and uh, another example of like how I play is like someone sent me these little triangles, these drafting triangles, which we use a lot in printmaking and bookmaking. And then I was really excited because I thought one of those triangles was a tiny Dorito, but it was actually like a brass triangle. And then the, the burrito, the Dorito ended up being this inspiration of these like, you know, this paper Dorito and paper snacks. Um, so this is me making prototypes of a paper Dorito. Um, which is interesting because the first few are actually digital prints and I didn't like the way that digital Dorito looked. And so, you know, sometimes to make something really look like something else, paint is the only way to go. And so this is the painting of like Dorito paper. Um, 
right before in early quarantine, another friend of mine's daughter ran out of Pez for their Pez dispenser and demanded that their father just make some paper Pez to fill. You know, so so that's a huge inspiration of this time, right? Like we can't just go and get Pez right now because no one was to go into any of these stores um, at the time. And so he posted this on Instagram. And so then I made a paper Pez. So between the paper Dorito and the paper Pez started this practice of um, slowly building all of these paper snacks. Um, I think also in part because my daughter, like, you know, I don't know if there's parents in the audience, but like feeding a child is like an all encompassing like obsession. Um, so at this point, there's probably about 30 or 40 different snacks of which I have been playing and building more elaborate like snack sculptures with the snack sculpture practice. Thinking about each of these forms is like just like in terms of like color and shape, you know, or this other friend that I met on the internet called, um, it's not, his name is not really Manto Chen. Manto is a steamed bun in Chinese. And his whole feed is just a picture of him holding the steamed bun. And so to play with him, I made, you know, a paper copy of a steamed bun and sent, tagged him in that picture. Um, you know, careful what you post on Instagram, because I might try to make you a paper copy. I asked for his address, and I shipped it to Hong Kong. It cost me $17.25 a shape to ship basically like paper in the shape of a steamed bun. Um, and then he he received it in Hong Kong and posted like a, a picture of it, right? And I, I really wanted to sort of end this talk with this project because, um, you know, because the internet, right? And this ability for us all to like digitally share information or communicate. Um, and then also of course, like the magic of the network of, of mail, right? And that bringing it back to paper is like how, you know, I, how I play how I've been playing with people all over the world. And that's a final snack sculpture. Um, and so I'm done with this talk, but I just always want to end with like a gift, you know? Um, if you stay in touch with me and go to my website, you will see a link that says a link that says a gift that you will find many of the free downloadable PDFs of projects that I hope that you that you make um, and you feel crafty and you you want to make something. Um, I also have an imprint, Yale Hymns, for other other ways to sort of stay in touch or support my practice. Um, and the the pro the project most related, I think, to this this community or perhaps the project that got me in touch with people running this um, was my last downloadable project, which is a sculpture. What do I call it? A sculpture for the future. And I saw this Byte magazine um, cover from 1981. A few years ago, I, found, I saw another artist was doing a presentation and brought this up as um, part of their part of what they're looking at. And I was so excited about this illustration of like what in the 80s we thought a computer looked like, the future computer and the fact that it has like an entire keyboard that's tiny. And so I built a, a paper copy of that illustration and it's available as a download or like a like a published book um, for you to make your own uh, sculpture for the near future your own little computer watch so I, I hope that you all do and stay in touch with me because um, I would love to see future watches on everybody's wrists thank you um this was an incredible incredible talk and I have lots of questions and um I know a few people are adding things um on the, the chat about how beautiful and amazing. Um, and I'll start with an audience question. I have so many of my own, but um, one of the questions was um, that there's this, this creative tension that you lean into between practice and labor and use value. And can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, you know, it's such a big question because I think at the end it's, it's so central into like my, my my art practice and also like my pedagogy as a teacher. Um, I think people often, I, I mean, for many people, maybe creativity is like a real like freeing and sort of expressive like act. For me, it's so, it's actually deeply caught up in practice and routine and discipline and math and science and geometry, you know, and, and maybe that's 
because I come from many generations of engineers and it's just like mutated itself into like this creative sort of form, you know, but I, I have a lot of practices that are really like, it, and, and then it's weird because even though it's so disciplined and it's ambitious in, in its template and the craftsmanship is so serious, the result is always so playful. Like I'm the most serious playing person that I, like I try to like play so seriously, right? And, and play as like the way that, the best way that humans learn copying as the one of the ways that humans definitely learn you know and I think in art we try to think like the genius artist and it's originality it's original everything you know talent originality and and for me personally like I those are I think I like our false kind of false concepts right like there there's a there's a training and a discipline and and a limit that makes all of that kind of creativity like I, I speak a lot with the students about like when I limited it materially to paper, then it was like a million things could happen because the one limit is that it's going to be this one material, you know? And when you're faced with all of the choices in the world, it's hard to know which path. But if you just go on this one path, you won't be, you'll be amazed how many things you start to see and how many ways you can push this like one material further and further, you know? So that's like, it's such a tangent really because we could, whoever asked that question, I could, we could talk forever, you know? But I just, I think so much about that. Like I think in that early iPhone project, right? Like we need those phones to be productive. We don't, we don't even know, we can't get anywhere. We can't buy anything. We need it so much. There's that idea of labor. Then, and now we're so connected. We all are working off of them, right? But then there's the labor of who makes all of these phones and makes this technology that we all then three years throw away and the great environmental cost of that, right? Then there's the, all the people, who, all the contractors and the architects and the engineers who have to like put those outlets in the wall. And that's safe wise, we need to have electricity X number of feet. There's a whole other construct, right? Of like a useful space, you know? And then, and then there's the sculpture and people all the time are like, did you 3D print those outlets? I was like, I could go to Lowe's and buy them for 79 cents, you know, like, there's nothing cheaper than an outlet, right? So it's like the the val all of those values are are so caught up. You know, if I sold every one of those chargers for what iPhone charges for one of their chargers, then it would be far more expensive artwork. You know, and that's through a mechanical, you know, industrial sort of mechanical process. But let us not deny the fact that there are humans at the end of that line working. Yeah. And and they look a lot like me, right? So we didn't even kind of unpack, right? The ch oh, I'm sorry, I, I went there, but I did a little bit. Oh, no, I think it's really important <laughs> to go there. Um, and yeah. I, I actually had a, a, a follow-up question about that, where we talk about, you know, the, the in, in some ways, we, we were always taught, like, technology is going to be here forever, and late, you know, paper is, is ephemeral, it's, it tears, it, it burns, it, and yet paper is, is sort of a... a some, you know, we've, I have books that are a couple hundred years old or, or something, and yet the, in technology, I mean, there are two things. One is um, we, it is very ephemeral. I mean, a couple of years, like the film strips you showed, but even early like floppy disks or something, we, we can't use them anymore. And yet they linger forever in an environmental way. And there is also that human cost of production with the, yeah. the um, you know, the impact on humans of producing, we never get to see the people who have to manufacture these things, or we never yeah. get to see the people who have to dispose of them. Um, and, and so how, how does sort of the, you know, you, the choice of one paper, uh, paper and constraint, those notions of environment and labor, and do you want to talk more about that? Because I do want, I think it's important to go there if we work in the field of technology. Absolutely. I mean, you know, what's wrong with it disappearing, you know, like, it's, it's actually the fact that it's sort of compostable, and that paper can disappear, it, and paper can be made into other paper. That's what's very beautiful about it, you know, like you can make, I have other projects where I actually take cloth and turn it into paper, and that these, these objects that are natural objects actually can be reused so many different ways, or that growing more trees and more fiber helps reduce the CO2 admission and, you know, that we could be trying to plant more and that it is far more uh, renewable, right? Like 
I think the floppy disk is a beautiful, I mean, those floppy disks will be here far longer than anyone here. And they barely, their blip in, I think, our kind of like technology trajectory is so tiny, but they're here, you know, forever, right? I, uh, so paper is so interesting that way. The other thing I think that's beautiful is like its relationship to the archive, you know, it can be here as long as we as humans decide to keep it. You know, it takes very little to protect it, but you, we could, we could make that decision. We libraries and archives all over have made that decision too, you know? So it's, I think that that's really interesting. Like the, the little bits of paper that do survive that are like deemed what is written on here is like, you know, important in this form. Right. You know, so I, there's just, there's so much there. And I think like really towards the end, of the projects, especially like the quarantine ones, like all of those art objects that people made were sent in the mail, like just in envelopes, 55 cent, you know, envelopes, right? And it's like, it's still cheap to send a little bits of <laughs> paper. It's not like free, but then as we know, nothing is free. I mean, we have the other extreme, of course, are the NFT, you know, people are always like, what about if you get into NFTs? And like, that's such a, the opposite in some like huge, environmental energy costs no real object here we have an object i don't know yeah we could all these questions we could unpack forever i love it yeah i i wanted to ask you a little bit about um i want you know i was going to ask you about creative inspirations and if someone is moving into this field what they should think about and and i'll let you mull on those but i i actually wanted to ask you about something when you were talking about mechanical objects and there was still that sense and and your approach to making there's such joy in the, in the tactile physicality of the process of making and 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 these objects are precious and have value and use because of that that the use was to bring some sort of joy it felt like to the the maker and the person viewing it and and I am wondering whether when we look at electronics and when we look we don't see that and I'm wondering whether that that um perspective is something like do you think of ways that that could be brought into so that those hidden people in yeah I'm from a country where that yeah some of the people making it up from there and whether yeah. they you know whether that could be brought into that process and part of that is like the value and valuing their skill and time and 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 implications on their lives, but also the the that we we've taken whether the taking away that joy and, and how how you think it could be brought back into sort of any kind of large scale manufacturing because you've made man, you know multiples of objects and printmakers have done that and bookmakers have so I'm just curious of that that joy of making and whether whether that how that you think you see could see it play out in this world of like just large scale hidden manufacturing. Yeah, it's such a good I mean, I, I would hope so, you know, like one thing, one thing for sure about the projects is I actually use um, like I'll use plotter cutters and and things, you know, different kind of tools to help me cut out all the forms and they're all vector based patterns after they're done. And so I always joke with some of my colleagues. I'm like, I, I, you know, I'm using it, you know, like, I, <laughs> like I, I, it's not that I, I don't, you know, use a lot of the sort of technology to help me make it, but in the end, the building has to be done by hand. Like the actual building has to be done by hand. And a lot of, one of the blessings of not knowing how to, um, you know, how to 3d scan and, and draw in 3d is because like, the computer version of unfolding these forms is so rigid, right? Like it's so, it, it has like very clear logic. And you can see that when you look at like paper crafts, like they all kind of look the same, you know? But since I don't know how to do that, then my resolution is like a human resolution based on like what I know about like paper making and molding and folding and embossing and, you know, like, ta like kind of older school, like paper manipulation. Um, and so they're all, in the end, it all ha kind of has to be made by hand, right? Um, and so I have like, I, you know, I have big dreams of like getting the kind of art grant or, or having enough of a platform of an ambitious enough thing to be able to hire people, you know, at a really amazing living wage to help me build, you know, like I, like a, like a, like a you know, a, a studio full of people helping me build these essentially useless things because they're basically just like air built right but it, it takes like 
you know, and, and I could really, I can really relate a lot of that to, to like gendered labor as well, right? Of like women and, you know, the whole relationship of textile industry to like women working in factories, uh, knitting and crocheting, all of these like domestic home, you know, repetitive craft-based practices. We have the time, you know, and we have the skill and it's just going to be so sweet. Um, you know, to like, just like ha employ like all of this talent, you know, to build, you know, I, I it's a funding issue um, on the art scale or whatever. But I do think, you know, and I'm seeing, I think that there is a resurgence, right? And small, not resurgence, but I think like small, small business, uh, an increased value towards like handmade, you know, supporting ceramicists, fa you know, fashion people, people sewing clothes, tailoring, mending, we're seeing these things, right? Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, it come it, it come back at the same time that, you know, the NFT, you know, all of that stuff, right? We're seeing like suddenly it's like chic to learn how to mend or sew your own clothes, you know. So, I think it. I have, I have optimism for it. If anybody wants to, you know, I would love to like find a way to run it more like a business, but then the business like pays people very well, and we make things that don't help anyone other than objects to like love and hang on the wall and make you think about like space your space and 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 what art what scale art could be right like you know doesn't have to be like a huge steel thing cutting through a a, a huge sculpture garden it could be a a pencil shaving on the wall you know yeah, and, and, and this idea of like that scale that miniatures can have are precious and can have value and, and whether the use could be about the, the, the joy or value it brings to the, the person experiencing it or the, the person making it even and that, that, that use um, is missing and, and in part also the wonder of it is it's not destructive, the destructiveness is missing. And I, I am glad you brought up that notion of, of gender and, and maybe even nationality playing a role in what counts as things that have use or value in the world and what, what labor is compensated and you know who, who decides and how, how that is. Because I think that is a really important sort of issue that I think comes up in the work you do, which is sometimes you know, multiples in large scale manufacturing, very small objects. But I'm, I'm curious whether that's part of your motivation in creating it or whether that's something you want people to think about or that's just a direction I went in or something. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I think I think about, I think about that so much and, and one, but one concern is like how much of that is translated, I think in the work and how important that urgency is translated or is it just sort of more of the like sort of criticality intellectual like potential I think of art making you know and, and maybe that goes back to teaching right like yes like something so joy like that Pez you know the Pez right like it's it's just a candy but then when I you know the little Pez candy or whatever but then when I think about like the time of quarantine or you know a, a child demanding you know, why can't you just make this out of paper? Everything, you know, from a teacher standpoint, I think everything, no matter how small, has like a human story. It has all of that kind of criticality in it. You know, it's, you can't just look at an outlet and not think about all of these things. So, but I don't know if it, it always translates, you know, but I hope it does. Yeah, <laughs> and and since, since you do spend a lot of time teaching in some of these things, I, I wanted to know if you can share, since we have students, both sort of high school and college, and in all of us really as sort of students in some ways, if what are some inspirations or resources that were really powerful and helpful for you, and how would you, you know, what are suggestions you have for someone who wants to move and start doing things like this? What should they learn? I, I as a mathematician, I'm so delighted that you brought up math, but but there are lots of other things too. Yeah. Oh, you know what? You all love this story. So okay. I have two things to answer that one is that like when I was younger you know I would just love those books that had all those paper patterns to build paper toys I mean we've had paper toys for a hundred years there's there's paper dolls paper doll houses cars and now you can google anything if you google anything paper craft you will find free there's a community of people just like sharing these patterns you know and so I've always loved 
I've, I've, I've always made those and I've always loved making those. And the fact that they're just like free, if you will make like the play it, the playing it is the building of it. Right. It's like the cutting it out and the building of it. And I think that's so joyful. Um, and you can, um, when you go to my website and you see like the gift section that was really inspired by this community of just like free things or the fact that like you could be in your office. Like I was like, I was like, Oh, you're going to get an office job. But like you want to make art. You can just like print this sculpture and steal paper and ink from your employer and then like make this art, you know, during your like regular work hours, you know? So I, I, in a previous life used to call those things like, downloadable crafts for office workers or something you know it was like it was very tongue-in-cheek like things to do in zoom meetings to make yeah them. right like just make these things and then they're very though what's signature maybe signature what's specific about them is is that they're like they're definitely like artworks like one of my favorite ones is just like a paper orange peel and you just make it and you throw it on the ground because I like love when I see orange peels on walks so I just I just imagine people like peeling an orange and like you know, it's just like carelessly throwing an orange peel in the way that like orange just like breaks up the color of the outside, you know, so, so it's like, it's a paper craft that's not like a cool robot, you know, when you Google paper craft, it's like robots, fan fiction stuff, anime stuff, cars, it's very cool. So if you go to my site, you can download an orange peel, you know, so it's like, I, I don't know. So I think those like those things are huge. And the other thing is, is that I found this really old book, probably a hundred year old book called Observable Geometry. And in it, it was a geometry book, but it actually had all of these paper patterns to build shapes um, and the math behind. And so to learn the formulas, you would build cones and you would build hexagons and you would build circles. And I I love that book. That book was a big inspiration. I've published this other artist book called Lemmy's Gifts. Um, and it's a series of six different shapes and patterns. And if you build those shapes, then you would know the geometry behind like all my sculptures. It's basically like the six main math shapes and curves, right? That if you broke it down, you, you could see like if you looked at the film projector, you could see all of these different shapes embedded in those things. And of course, those shapes relate to children's toys and Froebel's gifts and kindergarten and this idea of like humans learn best through play and what are the basic forms that kids play with blocks cubes circles are the same shapes that create the world of paper sculptures right it's all very like element and so Lemmy's gift is this project that weaves it all in but I was helping a student try to make like a paper sculpture in my class and she was trying to find the circumference of something and I was like you know I was like you know like pi like two pi r you know like pi you get the diameter and do pi and she looked at me and her like it was like she goes oh my god <laughs> she's like I can't believe my math teacher never told me that I could use this to make things and she it was like such a good I was like yeah you know, how much, how much, so any math teachers out there, it's like, you know, get that Lemmy's gift or I'll share those like patterns with you or whatever. But yeah, she just had this, like this college student at CMU, like kind of finally made the connection that all those formulas and all those things like are related to real world, you know, the things that she actually wants to do, which was like build sculpture. So this has been so, so exciting. And I, I hope in some ways that we will have you here in person doing some sort of workshop or, or a talk. And um, sooner or later, I've always dreamed of doing sort of a paper engineering, paper craft or, you know, textiles, paper sort of thing. And, um, but I, I wanted to ask you, who are two other sort of artists, makers, people that you think we should go look at and invite possibly to future things. So who would you want to watch and, and want to oh my gosh. work with? Well, I mean, someone who's incredible, you've probably already had is like Kelly, Kelly Anderson, Kelly Anderson, K-E-L-L-I. Yeah. She's incredible. Um, and the amount of like engineering in her projects and her, like she's a real hero. I think if I wasn't so like embedded in academia and art, I'd like, 
you know, I just want to be her best friend. We're like internet friends and stuff. I think she's, she'd be amazing in that capacity. Who else? I have to think about the second person. There's so many people. Um, there, there is an illustrator. Last name I think is Toule. Pierre, maybe Toule, but he does these beautiful children's books with just like torn, torn paper, and it actually has a lot of work in the um, children's museum in Pittsburgh as well. Um, but he was also an amazing illustrator, just like the simplest structures, um, but a beautiful illustration. So I think if the three of us got together and then like published something it would be amazing. Okay, so yeah. we will plan. And yeah, we'll play. We'll play that way. Yeah. Um, and as a sort of final question before we, we um, I, I, I feel like I can just listen to you talk for hours about all this amazing work. But um, what, what are you mulling now? What are your sort of, do you have like creative experiments you have in mind, your future projects? Is there something like that's kind of bubbling up that you want to talk about? Or if you don't, that's okay too. Yeah. No, um, well, the, the biggest thing right now is just the Dream Cabin project is being published into a new artist book. So if there's anybody out there who wants to like get in touch or follow that project. Um, it's exciting because there's sort of such a huge amount of people who've contributed to that that project. So that's that's the biggest thing. That's my summer goal is to get that book out into the world. I have so many other like small weird sculptures I'm that I, aren't aren't worth vaguely describing. But the biggest the biggest personal like professional goal is is that big the the larger ambitious sculptural thing you know, and the ways that I can sort of fund that through, like, if the, if the creating of the work actually enacts the politics, right, of compensation, and of craft, and of community, and of people working together, right, and it isn't just like Ayman who works for my, Ayman herself free, in a crazy way, <laughs> you know, um, and I'm trying not to get too distracted with, like, snacks, to keep those really sort of big, big goals, you know? So I've had lots of big things that I've, I've want, I really wanted to do like a server, you know? Like I've seen some pretty wild servers inside of museums and like just thinking about all the knobs and wires and things that make, you know, things look like there's nothing there, you know? Talking about labor, right? Like there's so much to like power the cloud to see, for us all to look like we don't have offices and we don't have file cabinets and we don't like, we could just like work anywhere. There's like, there's just so much stuff. So it's like, I, I got, I have to keep those talks like this or closing questions like yours are helpful for me to remember, you know, those bigger goals, you know, because I can be very busy with my small, my small things. So Thank you. I mean, it was wonderful. We have such an amazing, uh, that you can share this amazing work and ideas and your time. Um, we will now go out of the live feed and into the studio for a second. So if we can end the live feed, thank you all for watching and remember to go to I mean's website and, and find your gift and start making.